Good morning, Happy Valley, and welcome back to another edition of the Penn State 365 podcast. I'm co- I'm your host, Richie Schneider, joined by my co-host, Dylan callahan Crawley. Dylan, what's going on, man? Uh, just another, uh, you know, another week in the books here. Uh, I got the game tomorrow. It's uh, football season's winding down a little, a little uh, sad, but uh, you know, it, it's been a, it's been a good one so far. Yeah. No. Well, if you talk to some fans, probably not. But <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't say good morning, happy valley. It should be a kind of sad valley. But it's weird because they're coming off a win. So yeah, <laughs> it, it's uh, that uh, Ohio State game uh, did them kind of dirty. So. But uh, this weekend, another chance for another win, another Big Ten uh, East win, because it's still divisions for now. Um, Maryland comes to town, or I mean, I'm sorry, they're going down to Maryland. Yep. Um, College Park, uh, what, they haven't lost in what, what was it, 14 years, something like that, in College Park? Uh, I, 14 games, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, 14 games, 14 straight wins or something like that down in College Park. Uh, mm-hmm. It's been a long, long time uh, since then. And uh, on top of that... If you would have asked me about this game at the beginning of the season or even before the season, yeah. I probably would have told you, hey, you know what? It might be competitive. Maryland has yeah. a chance to be one of the better teams in this conference. Yeah. The last three weeks, I'm kind of like, no. <laughs> the last four weeks, no, they're not. <laughs> they, they're back to old Maryland. Yeah, I mean, it, they started 5-0 and this year, and you're looking at it and thinking, oh, maybe this is the year that Maryland you know, doesn't drop some sort of stupid game. They can get to at least 9-3. and three. Maybe mm-hmm. if they're lucky uh, – upset one of the big three, get the 10 and two, but yeah, they, I, they lost that game to Ohio state and it kind of, you know, send them off the rails. So uh, with that back-to-back losses now, well, three straight losses, but losses mm-hmm. to Illinois and Northwestern back-to-back weeks. I mean, those are two of the, um, you know, one of the, some of the two worst teams in the big town West. Yeah. I mean, hell, David Braun's making a case for himself. Now he's beaten Minnesota. He's beaten. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> like, I, even even the Wildcats go four and eight this year. I I, I think Braun deserves some uh, Big Ten Coach of the Year uh, consideration. Yeah, one hundred percent. So now that, let's talk about this Maryland team. Everyone, first person you always talk about. Everyone always talks about it. I don't know how to pronounce Tagli Viola. Might that might be close. Talia um, Tagavilola. Tagavilola. I I always get it wrong. Um, but yeah, everyone talks about Talia. He's a hell of a quarterback. He's yep. probably not an NFL quarterback, in my opinion, personally, just because he's too small for me. But sure. Um, but yeah, no, he throw he puts up numbers, puts up huge numbers. He's got nineteen and six on the season, touchdown to interception ratio, twenty two hundred yards. He also ran for another eighty four, which I'm surprised he doesn't run for more. But he's ran for four touchdowns as well. Um, just talk about this offense a little bit. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a very Good uh, Maryland offense in the grand scheme of things, 32.6 points per game, which ranks top 40 in the country, totaling mm-hmm. over 400 yards per game. Uh, you you talked about Talia, one of the better quarterbacks, I think, in the Big Ten from a pure talent perspective, uh, 63.9% completion percentage this year. He's always been a decently solid completion percentage guy. Uh always has a strong touchdown interception ratio. He will throw interceptions. I mean, for yeah. his for his career, uh, you look at it, um, 32 interceptions in his career in probably 40 to 50 games. He, he does mm-hmm. throw interceptions, but he also throws quite a bit of touchdowns to go with that. 71 touchdowns, including 19 this year. Um, good, good quarterback. Uh, doesn't have his weapons from last year around him, but uh, he's done just fine with uh, Jay Sean Jones and Caden Prather at wide receiver being his two main guys. And then in the backfield, Roman Hamby, probably one of the running backs in the Big Ten that we don't talk about as a media en- uh, enough. Hamby, uh, you know, had that really good sophomore fr- retro freshman season last year for the Terrapins, mm-hmm. averaging uh, 5.3 yards per carry, almost got 1,000 yards. Uh a little bit of a step back this year, only 440 yards so far, but still averaging five carries a ga- uh, five yard five yards per carry. Um, really solid uh, running back that Penn State will be have to be careful with. But you know, this is a Penn State team that's been really good against the run all season, so I don't imagine that being much of an issue for them uh, mm-hmm. tomorrow against the Terrapins. I don't think the passing game is going to be a terrible issue for them either. Now the 
secondary has had some rough uh, play the last two games, especially Kalen King. But generally, I think they'll be able to contain this Maryland pass and attack enough. But notably, with Penn State's offensive struggles right now, this is a Maryland pass and attack that does have the ability, if Penn, if they come with their air game, to score on Penn State a few times and make this one uh, a bit interesting if uh, Penn State's offense isn't clicking. Yeah, no, I think that's my probably my biggest fear too uh, from Penn State's, Penn State's perspective is um, Deshaun Jones, man. He, he yeah. scares the hell out of me. He's been getting better and better each year. I know he's a fifth-year senior now, and it's – but literally, if you look at his numbers, he's went from like 180 to 220 to 550 yeah. last year. Now he's on pace for like six, seven hundred. Um, he's quick. He's fast. He's a great route runner. Solid hands. Um, he can go on the outside. He can play the slot. I think he's super underrated. And I think if he was on any other team, he'd probably be really good. But yeah. they don't talk about him enough because it's it's Maryland and they lose a ton. So yeah, and it's also worth knowing that for the longest time for Mike Loxley, it was all about that offensive line not being very. Uh, very good having some struggles, but mm-hmm. the, the Terrapins have fixed a lot of those offensive line issues, especially in the passing uh, in pass blocking. Only 14 sacks allowed this year, which you know it, it's not great, but it's it's not bad by any means. It puts them about 50th in the country. Um, mm-hmm. But a few years ago, this was a Maryland team giving up uh, way more than that. Uh, so uh, the, the Penn State's not going to. They regularly have, you know, a, a great – they match up well against Mary, Maryland Terrapins offensive line, <laughs> but they may not have the same success as they had in the last few years. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting how he's rebuilt that line because if you look, he has a transfer – or he's got a two-star, a three-star, a transfer from North Carolina Central, a transfer from Frostburg State. Yeah and a transfer from Elon and they've managed to put together a pretty decent line out of that group. So it just goes to show you that these, these linemen can be found just about anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, talking about their defense, it's actually pretty decent this year based on the numbers. Um, although yeah. they did just give up a lot of points to Illinois and a lot of points to Northwestern. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard to gauge if they're actually good because they've played such bad teams too. Yeah. They played Charlotte, Virginia, Towson. It's like, eh, so I, I don't really know what to think about their defense. I, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a defense that's on paper a solid defense. You look at their um, their run defense, uh, which has been up and down at times this year. On paper, only allowing 109 yards per game. But you look <clears> deeper, they, they've had games where they've allowed 148 yards 131 yards, 125 yards. Now, a lot mm-hmm. of that is also through quantity and not quality of runs. I mean, this season they've kept all their opponents but one to under four yards per carry. So that that's an interesting matchup for Penn State's rushing attack that really hasn't been explosive this year. You look yeah. at their secondary, um, that's where I think it, it'll be interesting to see if Penn State can expose them this week. Um you know, Northwestern last week threw for 265 yards. They allowed 263 yards in Virginia earlier this year, mm-hmm. 274 to Michigan State, uh, and over 300 to Ohio State. But we haven't seen Penn State really put up those kind of numbers this year, at least on a consistent basis. So I'm gonna, it's gonna be intriguing to see if Penn State can build off what they kind of showed in that last drive last week to win the game, carry it over mm-hmm. this week, and maybe find some more explosiveness in the passing game because. This is a Maryland front seven you really don't want to run into based off what they've done so far this season. Um, but there are holes in that secondary to take advantage of. But can the wide receivers get open? Yeah, um, I think the big name to watch back there would be Tarheeb Still, a New Jersey native. Um, yep. He's had a pretty good career for Maryland. Um, and they've actually produced a couple DBs now because Deontay yep. Banks was a first rounder last year. Um, Nick Cross. Um, Nick Cross. Geez, I forgot about him too. Um, um but yet yeah, he's been kind of up and down. Like he's had some really good games and some really bad games. Trahip still, yeah. so he he could be a lockdown corner, and then he could just be complete bust. So I don't know who you kind of line up against him because he actually flip flopped middle of the season. It looks like in terms of yeah. side of the field because he was playing on the left side and now he's on the right side. But um, 
I don't know. I don't I do like, do you just go straight up KLS? Do you kind of just rotate guys and just figure it out or? Yeah, I, I think, I think at this point kind of have to do a little bit of that. They're, they're going to rotate the guys they're comfortable with. The question is, are they comfortable? Who are they? <laughs> yeah. With, is it going to be three and four, three or four guys, or are they going to mm-hmm. dig a little bit deeper into the room this week? But based off what we've seen so far this season, I'm going to guess it's, you know, KLS. How, we'll see. Um, I'm, I wouldn't expect Trey Wallace to play this week just because mm-hmm. I'm not sure how quickly an arm could actually heal like yeah. that. Um, Though James Franklin didn't say he was after the season, which is good news. Um, But beyond that, I'm guessing we'll see a little bit of Liam Clifford. We'll see um, Mm -hmm. possibly some Malik McLean. We finally saw him get extended amount of snaps last week after kind of disappearing for uh, the better part of the season after his rough game against Illinois. Um, And then... Uh, the, I, I'm sure they'll use the tight ends quite a bit. And they'll try to get Dante Cephas involved, but they've, mm-hmm. you know, they've tried to get him involved all season, just hasn't worked. Yeah, I'm kind of intrigued to see how this works because um, we didn't see Trey Wallace in practice on Wednesday, so it just yep. seems like he's probably out at least for this week, maybe next week too. Who knows? Yeah. Um, after that, we said KLS already. He's guaranteed starter. Blah blah blah. Like yep. go to wide receiver one if you want to call him that. Um. I think Cephas is going to, and this is just me speculating, I think Cephas is going to get a lot of burn this week, and I think they're going to use him a lot more just for the sole fact that they put him out there for the media after practice. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So maybe it's just me being a a little skeptical and questioning a little bit, but. No, I think that's that's fair. Um, And I also think a lot, I know a lot of Penn State fans are disappointed in how he's performed this year, but I think, uh, Mm -hmm. and Marty has said this on previous episodes, um, him coming in in the summer, not the winter, uh, probably affected his development here quite a bit. And I, I think after he has an off season in the program this year, uh, we could see a much better Dante Cephas next fall. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's no secret this wide receiver room has been awful. Yeah, um, yeah. Cephas was has been a bust so far. Um, Malik McLean played what fifty snaps last week and had zero receptions. Yeah, he had a couple um, of, a couple of targets, but. And I know special. they run a ton of 12 personnel sets, but like at this point, you got to just keep trying guys like Caden Saunders comes out, gets a touchdown. I know garbage time. Um, what do you call it? They're not playing real defense, honestly, Yeah. but just start trying new guys. We heard Amari Evans all off season and now we don't hear a lick about him. Yeah. Amari Evans just uh, five games played offensively, three targets. It, it's, it's a major question mark uh, going into the next season. We've, we've, you know, beat the horse to death over on the on the pod about it but it's just Penn State obviously is only gonna run the guys out there that they think have earned the playing time but we all agree at some point or another you kind of just have to get some of these guys involved during the game and see what they can do uh, because um, you need to find answers going into next season because right now that room is pretty barren of talent it looks like and yeah. if, if, if there's nobody in that room that can make an impact, I mean, um, I, I think I think next year's team could still be pretty good. But if there's no – if the wide receiver room doesn't take a step forward next year, the, this team is going to have a hard time getting to the college football playoffs. Yeah, I think you got to hit the portal hard this offseason yeah. for the sole fact that – don't get me wrong, they're bringing in decent receivers. They're, I'd even say they're pretty good. Peter Gonzalez is good. Yeah. Josiah Brown's good, but Josiah Brown has a torn ACL and a torn MCL. Yep. Peter Gonzalez has an ACL from a year ago who looks fully recovered, but still it's a freshman. Yep. You can't and, trust a freshman out there. Yeah, no, exactly. I I think they have a chance to have three really nice wide receivers in Peter Gonzalez, Tizier, Denmark, and, and Brown. But mm-hmm. none of those guys I looked at as seniors and what were saying, oh, they're a guy who can make an impact in year one. <clears throat> Now, maybe one of them, you know, gets their four games and presses, continues to play, but I don't think any of them are going to step in and be, you know, a game changer uh, in the yeah. passing game, at least next year. I think Denmark, I think all three have a chance to be that player down the road, but mm-hmm. not next year. All right. So, with that being said, we kind of went through the entire team, ranted about the wide receivers like we do every week at this point. <laughs> and, uh, Let's let's get right to the predictions. Um, it's a eight no eight point spread, forty nine and a half over under. What do you got this week? 
Yeah, I like I like Penn State to win this one still. I think they're the, I think they'll show up better than they did last week. They usually show up for these Maryland games. Um, Maryland's only two wins against Penn State came in 2014. You know, uh, a mm-hmm. sanctioned road roster that still had a lot of holes, and um, 2020, which uh, let's be honest, in any sport, I think you can throw that 2020 window the year out the window. Um, it's for a lot. I mean, just so much shit went on that year that I think you throw that out the window. Um, but outside that, Penn State's kind of dominated this series. Penn State has dominated, dominated when they've gone to College Park. James Franklin, um, you know, has a lot of personal connections with this Terrapins program. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if I would call it bad blood, but um, he, he enjoys – I think beat in Maryland more than he enjoys beating most teams. Um, whether it goes back from when he, you know, was supposed to be coaching Wade in there and didn't get the job or the, mm-hmm. you know, the pregame non handshake back in 2014. <laughs> uh, Maryland hasn't done themselves much favors with James Franklin. Um, but, so, but I think regardless, Penn State's a better team. I think the offense will have a decent day, not a great day. The defense, I expect to bounce back from a bad performance last week. Uh, mm-hmm. Give me Penn State to win this one. 20, we'll go 31, 17. Okay. Well, you're almost hit the nail on the head with my prediction. I got 35, 17. Okay. Um, I think, obviously, before I said the Terps offense is their strong point. Unfortunately for them, Penn State's strong point is their defense. So yeah. they're kind of... And I think Penn State's defense outweighs their offense, and I, I think it's just going to be an ugly day for the Terps. They might score a late garbage time touchdown, mm-hmm. um, and that's where they'll get that 17-point mark. Um, I think Drew Alarn, the running backs, are just going to kind of take over this game. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much we'll see of uh, the deep ball, quote-unquote, that they don't throw really at all, or they do yeah. once in a while, I guess, now. <laughs> um, they do it, threw it the most of any week last week, so perhaps uh, yeah. it's a step in the right direction. I mean, you, I guess you could test it against a shitty secondary like Maryland, so why not go for it? But uh, I think this run game might actually – This is I say it every week, actually, so this this is the week again. One, one week you'll be right. Yeah, the running backs – well, this is the week they break out. They're going to have a huge game, and it's going to happen this week. I could feel it. Maybe not, but that's, that's what I'm predicting right now. Um, last but not least, the 2024 schedule came out yesterday. For the first time in 14, no, 13 seasons, something like that, Penn yeah. State will open Se- Big Ten play. Second, second time. time. Second time. Second time in 14 yeah. seasons. Yeah. Penn State will open as Big Ten play as a home game. Unfortunately, yeah. they're opening the season on the road, though. What a cool road environment. Yeah, no, that's uh, going to West Virginia on August 31st. That's uh, that that would be cool. That's, you know right down the road uh, in the grand scheme of things. So I'm sure Penn State fans mm-hmm. will make uh, a big trip down there. And, yeah, fun environment uh, for, you know, an old rivalry game too. Um, I know yeah. Penn State, that really doesn't mean much. Um, but for a lot of the older fans, they remember when these two teams were uh, rivals. So uh, that that will be a cool experience. I'm looking forward personally to that game next season, head down to um, – Yeah. And, and down to West Virginia. Uh, Never been there, so uh, well, never been to the stadium. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I probably, probably have to join you on that one because I am uh, very intrigued by the Mountaineers' uh, yeah. environment, and I hear it's just basically uh, it sounds so almost Penn State like it's just like a little small town, and that's it. Yeah. The mountains around it, and uh, that has a chance to be a really solid West Virginia team last year. I mean, the Mountaineers have been mm-hmm. pretty good this year. Neil Brown's earned himself neck another year, so um, yeah, that that could be a a good game next year. Uh, I'm going to do a little rapid fire with you. Yeah. Um, just tell me win loss and give me a quick sentence. Why um, I, I, do we have to go through Bowling Green and Kent state? I think we're just going to assume wins, right? No. Yeah. I think the first four games there, you can, yeah. uh, I, I'm cons- I, I think early uh, Penn state should win those first four games, but the next five game stretches where the next season will be made or broken. Yeah. Um. So that that let's go right to UCLA. You said you you think they're going to be a win. So actually, let's move past that. USC at uh, USC. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah. So you know, five, five and zero, possibly five and zero coming into that USC game. I think this all comes down to the offense. The defense loses a lot, but I think the defense is still going to be a very good defense next year, top twenty in the country type, just not top five. Um, mm-hmm. USC. 
losing Caleb Williams, will they fix their defense? Um, no. Probably not. Um, <laughs> the question is, who, what's next for them at quarterback? Um, I'm going to say Penn State loses to USC right Ooh. now. Um, I'm going to say loses to USC right now. But I, uh, but I think I think if the offense can find some wide receivers this offseason, I think that's a, a very winnable game. That's that's perfectly fair. Um, I agree with you. Uh, by week, the week after, then you got to go out to Camp Randall. It's not an easy environment. Plus, yeah. Luke Fickle, year two, will have more of his guys there. They might be more air raidish than they are yeah. kind of currently. Um, what do you think about that one? Um, yeah, it's it's tough to gauge what the Badgers are going to be in a year, but um. You know what? Let me flip flop. Let me say beat USC, but I think they lose to Wisconsin. I, I think okay. I think that's a chance. That has a chance to be you know a cold October night game in Madison. Uh, Penn State historically does not perform great coming off the bye week under James Franklin. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think they beat USC. So let's say six and zero coming into Wisconsin, uh, which I guess I haven't seen Wisconsin schedule. It could be very well an undefeated Wisconsin team as well. But yeah, I didn't check it. Um, yeah, you know, let's say they lose to Wisconsin. Just uh, Penn State very rarely has dropped these kind of games, but I think the Badgers have a chance to be pretty good next year. Then you got a big one in Ohio State coming to Beaver Stadium November second. No. Um, if just a guess, big noon kickoff, maybe depending on what yeah. the teams look like. But uh, thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, I mean historically, I should say a should be a loss here, I guess. But I mean. It's tough. It, it's tough. Um, I, I guess I'll have to go loss again. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington coming to town, making the trip across the coast, across the country. Sorry. Yeah. Um, for the first time ever, I think. Uh, at least to state college. Yeah. So, thought. What do you think? Actually, the Huskies have a chance without Michael Penix, or? Uh, no, I think the, I think <laughs> the Huskies next season are maybe a seven and five team. Okay. Uh, so. Um, you know, that's good for them, though. Yeah. No, it's perfectly fine. Uh, but I think I think Penn State gets the better of them in that game. Uh, so it's another uh, one. I'm gonna, for Penn State. I'm gonna group the next two together, um, just because I can probably win. already guess your thoughts. Uh, per, at Purdue and then at Minnesota. Win, win, win. win. But Minnesota could be tough. Cold again. Mm -hmm. Madison in October is gonna be cold, but Minnesota in late November could be like ten degrees and snowing. Yeah. So. There, there's kind of the weather factor you have to take into account with that one. But I think on mm -hmm. paper, Penn State's a much better team, so Penn State should win. And then, obviously, last one, Maryland's coming to town. Uh, win? Win. Okay. Win. So so we got ten two. two two losses on the year? So 10, ten and two ten again. And two. <laughs> ten and two again. <laughs> Oh god! But I but mean, I think uh, I think that's people fair. are gonna riot. <laughs> I, I I think I think ten and two is the most likely case scenario. I do think mm -hmm. if they figure out some things in a perfect in a perfect world, I think eleven and one is probably the ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, ten and two is very not very likely, but likely. And then mm -hmm. nine and three is probably. Um, I, I I can see I can see, I I can't see them going much lower than nine and three. Um, but I, I don't okay. think they're going to have the team to run through that schedule next year. I think they're going to get tripped up one time in that five game stretch, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's USC, maybe it's Wisconsin. Um, but, that, but it comes down to Ohio State. I mean, if they beat Ohio State, that kind of changes the whole aspect of the season if you lose one of those other games, but also mm -hmm. an expanded college football playoff 10 and 2 with this type of record, this type of strength of schedule, strength of record. Should get Penn State into a college football playoff next year. Now, last but not least, I have one quick question for you. Um, and this is the most important one of all because no one cares about the record. No one cares about what they do this weekend against Maryland. Which game is the whiteout next year? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, saving it for Ohio State would be good, but big noon kickoff, do you really want to use that? Um, I think I think it may be um, UCLA is – UCLA's trip over to Happy Valley. Um, hmm. Washington could make sense, but I think UCLA may have a chance to be the 
second best team Penn State faces next year. Interesting. Uh, I, Chip, I think because that Kelly's def- return to PA, that defense is pretty damn good, and it, it comes down <laughs> to Dante Moore. Can Dante Moore take a step up? He has not been very good this year, um, mm-hmm. but if he can take a step forward, that UCLA team has a chance to be really good next year, uh, especially mm-hmm. with that defense. Yeah, I'm looking right now. All-time record of uh, two and four against UCLA. Last time they came to State College, it's 1967. UCLA won 17-15. The last time the two teams met was 1968 out in L.A., 21-6 Penn State. So it's kind of been whoever's home has lost. Yep. So, and that's the tough thing about the USC trip, too, <laughs> which I was leaning and lost originally. It's mm-hmm. that We haven't seen James Franklin and Penn State or any of these Big Ten teams really have to go across country during the week and then turn around and play a game two days later. Usually, you know, it's coming mm-hmm. during a bowl game. And at least you have time to adjust, and you don't have time to adjust going uh, in that really there. Um, and then with USC, the other question is really just who's that quarterback next year? Is it Miller Moss? Uh, uh, who's it going to be? That's a that's a very good question. Um, all right, I think that that's really all we got. Any final thoughts before we sign off? No, I, I think I'm good. All right, cool. So that's another edition of the – actually, before I even do go there, um, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below on our YouTube channel. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Pods or Google, et cetera, whatever podcasting app you're on, give give us a quick review. Give us a five-star review real quick because it helps make the pod better, helps us grow, helps us get uh, our reach out to more Nittany Lion fans. And um, that's another edition of the Penn State 365 podcast signing off.